Thank you, Nav. Good afternoon, everyone. We have bottom in sight. No hold here. Auto XY in. So you're watching now live the Okeanos Explorers second dive of the Deep Connections expedition yeah. to the U.S. and Canada. We are currently at the Verl Steps site, yeah, diving we'll at a depth ones. of 2,485 meters, exploring this very interesting part of Verrill Canyon that has a very unique geological feature. Back down. This is Megan Putz, your biology lead from the University of Hawaii. Hi, this is uh, Jeff Obeltz, your geology lead from the Naval Research Lab. Jeff, can you tell us a little bit about the geology of this area? Uh, sure, Megan, and uh, this is a very good time to ask me as I spend a little bit of our time as we are transiting down the water column, uh, reading up on a couple key papers on the geology of this area. It's really interesting. It seems like one way or another, it was the action of submarine landslides uh, that formed the distinctive steps that uh, compose uh, the Verrill Steps formation that we're diving on. And the big question seems to be whether it was more of a turbidity current, which is a really fast sheet-like flow of sediment moving over the seafloor that formed it, or whether it was a debris flow, which is where a large chunk of the um, a canyon wall or something, fall, or the head of a canyon, falls away in one motion without igniting into a really fast and far-moving turbidity current. So those are on two of the kind of end spectrums of submarine landslides, whether they're acting really quickly and far-reaching or quickly and not moving far. One way or the other, one of those features, a turbidity current or a debris flow, form the steps that we see that we're diving on today. So what exactly is a turbidity current for those who aren't very familiar with that term? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, a turbidity current is what happens. So a, a way to think about it is that sometimes when a submarine landslide happens, which is just for anybody who might not be acquainted exactly what it sounds like, a landslide underwater, um, if the landslide happens on a slope that's steep enough, it can uh, form a process called ignition in which this mass of sediment that is moving down slope incorporates enough water into the body of the sediment that it becomes suspended above the seafloor. When that happens, its density contrast is a lot lower than between sediment and water, and it becomes a sediment water slurry. And the net effect of that is it can travel uh, hundreds or even thousands of kilometers across the seafloor as a really erosive process. Sort of like uh, an avalanche underwater? That's a good way to put it, actually. Yeah, yep. Um, you know, avalanches can travel down mountain slopes. Um, the really unique thing about turbidity currents is that they can um, travel really, really far on relatively flat terrains. So what you see at the base of these submarine canyons a lot of times is a uh, river-looking system going out across the continental rise, which is a really, really flat part of the seafloor, and that gets carved out by these turbidity currents because now, when you get a chance, even when it looks like the seafloor slope is so flat that meters. there shouldn't be able to be gravity movement Thanks. across it, turbidity currents continue to be suspended. That's really interesting. So now that we're on bottom, you can see that we are landing in a soft sediment area with not as much life as we saw yesterday during yesterday's dive. And uh, previous dives within this canyon were done at shallower depths, but this is the first exploration in the deeper steps area of the canyon. And we're hoping as we transverse across this sort of flat stepped area, we're going to reach a sloped area that might have some hard substrate where corals and sponges might be growing. So we're going to explore Great. a couple Thanks, different man. types of terrain during our dive. Animals that we're likely to see down here are going to be sea cucumbers, uh, sea stars, as well as sediment dwelling uh, corals such as sea pens and maybe some anemones. And fish okay, tend to aggregate in areas of flat sediment. All right. So maybe down. we'll see a few interesting fishes along the way. Dial in Z bias a little. Get the 
And Megan, uh, the species that you were discussing, the uh, sea cucumbers and the sea pens, those would be um, the kind of characteristic yeah, of this environment that we're in right now, correct? This soft zero. sediment bed? From the 80. Yes, yes, those okay. are soft sediment dwellers. Uh, sea cucumbers will feed upon the sediment and it'll pass right, through like their the digestive uppers systems. Are out. Um, and I think I spotted a sea star yeah, yeah, uh, when we were looking in a different up. direction. Yeah, go for it. So they are out here, and then there are a few sponge and coral Go species that, that do anchor in sediment. So we're not going to be free of corals and sponges, right. even so in these sediment areas, here even overall. though harder substrates tend to host a more diverse array of uh, coral species. Great, that makes sense. And um, just to confirm that the idea with uh, we're starting at this base for a nice soft landing for our ROV, but the hope is is that once we start uh, transversing the step, the eponymous step of the barrel steps, that okay. we might hope to see some of the uh, uh, communities like corals and sponges that we observed yesterday. Is that correct? Uh, that's the thought process. Okay. Uh, a lot's going to have to depend on the geology of the area. Uh, usually when we see steep slopes, uh, not that uh, I know we um, see I think also a harder substrate that corals move. and sponges can attach to. I think, I think um, in general they want to uh, get the really slope. I'm not really sure yeah, if this is going to be a hard and, sloped environment. Yeah. I'll get in touch with them now. We'll have to wait and think see we're pretty, when we get there. Pretty close what to set up. How do you guys feel? Well, it'll yeah, also depend on upon the, uh, the sixth sense of our uh, seafloor mapping extraordinaire, Mike White, as well. So. I think uh, uh, I think the odds are in our favor if Mike picked out the site. Watch the lead pilot. Hey, so we're uh, pretty much all set up here. Uh, got our swing arms out and Z bias close to dialed in, and uh, I think we're ready to start the dive here. Looks like we'll be moving west northwest, like Nav said, um, kind of up to this uh, step feature. Um, so if it's okay with you, we'll get a ship move going in that way now, and you guys just call things out that you want to take a closer look at. Okay. Sure, yeah, we'll try to find that before we get moving. So, Megan, it looks like in about the center of our range, we're going to start to be pending to the left is some sort of uh, fish on the seafloor. Do you have any uh, idea what that might be? Um... Are you talking about this I little thing going off the right side of the screen? Yep, that's there, right. right. I that's can't a get it shrimp. On sonar. Shrimp, okay. Uh, maybe I need to update my glasses prescription. Yeah, you can tell it's a shrimp because it, its legs were moving relatively slowly. You want me and to then follow I you think around what we're seeing yeah, please. might be a type of a conoderm, some sort of sea star. Is this the uh, subject that you wanted to take a closer yeah, look at? Yeah, let's take a zoom yeah. on this pilot. Actually, that, that's, that might be about as far as I can go. We can try to zoom from here, though. Come on, everybody. Yeah, no, All right. So it looks like we're doing our yeah, first zoom on the first biology of the, the dive. Hold there, video. Thank you. So this is a type of sea star um, in the family Brasingidae. Uh They hold their arms up in the air above them in order to capture food in the water column. So they're actually a filter feeder type of star. Um, maybe Chris Ma, if he's watching, will call in and talk yeah, to us a little bit more about what we're seeing. Get a move in. And yeah, then if, next we're going, to if we're heading that way anyway, let's, let's get a shot. Little in, squat yeah. lobster hanging out on the bottom. And I'm also spawning so, yeah, a couple of sea pens and some sponges and spotted around in the sediment. Move, probably around 20 meters or so. Okay, let's come on in a little bit more video. I'm kind yeah, of like so bouncing maybe around not at the, the end of my time. The absolute here. bonanza of life that we were seeing immediately yesterday, but it seems that even in areas where there's uh, sparse biological habitation, that sounds um, good to me. As yeah. this flat area yeah. is, it's there's it's still really uh, some organisms who make do with what they can get. And uh, Megan, I really appreciated yesterday the uh, the primer on the difference yeah, between actual there, lobsters, like, crabs, and yeah, spot lobsters yesterday. So I'm putting that ahead, knowledge into play right now. Could you uh, refresh my memory on that? Well, I heard someone uh, beep in on the line. Uh, who's joining us? Range two zero meters. It's Ma. Three, one, zero hey, Chris. Good to knots. hear from you. Hey, sorry about uh, just blurting that out. 
How are you guys doing? Oh, we're doing great. We didn't see too many sea stars yesterday. like you had a productive dive yesterday. But it was very productive. Let's come wide video. I'm gonna <laughs> yes, I can see. So um, we, we are looking at, as you said, a Brasingid sea star. Uh, that is actually a general term um, because there are actually two families within the uh, larger group, the Brasingida. And this one turned out to be in the other group, the Freyella Day. Uh, so this one is probably in the genus Freyella. And I would hazard to guess that the most commonly encountered species in this area is something called Freyella elegans. Um, so that's possibly what it is. Um, you'll note that if we uh, zoom in on this or another one, which we'll probably see later on, um, the plates on the arms and the disc are flattened and uh, sort of uh, yeah, form kind of a pavement as here. opposed to forming distinct the uh, ribs or uh, what's called costations on the arms. Yep. And that's typically how one uh, identifies Freyella or separates okay. Freyella yeah, from uh, sort of the, like the ones the in the proper Brasingidae per se. Um, there are other yeah, subtle differences like that have to do with arm syzygies and whatnot, but, today. Um, but, but Just, uh, that's a bit much for now, and especially you might, you with the detail with the gains, uh, uh, that, that's required or, uh, is not always visible. Resolution. Uh, these are actually named after uh, Nordic gods, and so... Freyella is named for Freya, the goddess, uh, the wife of yeah, Odin. And it, this, the story so. for these animals is we'll that they're, um, uh, the, so the, the idea there's a so brooch that Freya wears, which is thrown into the abyssal ocean uh, so and, and by Loki. The, and, um, and so, you know, Brasingid's thought to be this representation of this brooch so you see, like, living in the abyssal the ocean from Freya. Hence, okay. all of the names of Brasingid kind of tend to be uh, Nordic gods of some kind. More um, and so we'll see more of that. But uh, this one is in a uh, feeding bowl posture, and so its and arms right are kept up in a sort of semi-round arrangement as yeah, the current the other, presumably um, it. moves through and uh, food is caught by the spines, the top which the are covered too. with you little bear traps, change. what I used to call uh, the Velcro of yeah. death, uh, because yep. there are, uh, these are the things that capture little hyperid amphipods and crustaceans you can also, um, uh, as, uh, if you change as the water the current from, like, uh, brings medium, them through, the and they're caught by little bear traps, essentially. And um, I've seen around. these little bear trap capture uh, uh, fish before on Okeana dives. So, uh, yeah, so they look very passive and they look beautiful, uh, an undersea but flower, but they're actually pretty deadly like predators. That. I love all these fun star sea star facts. It's great. <laughs> Thanks for calling well, in. <laughs> and, uh, I, I would also I would also just chime in that the Veral steps are named after uh, an echinoderm worker. Uh, well, he worked on echinoderms and corals, among other things. Addison Emery Verrill. And um, he was uh, a, a person who had quite the reputation video. amongst the scientists of his day. Uh, as He would often sweep into collections and uh, put names on all of them. And, uh, like I think it was Austin Clark, one of the curators here, who said once he had visited a collection, it had been verilized because he had gone through and, and sort of swept through with everything, uh, putting yeah, names on it and such. Um, yeah, and, so well, there are other <laughs> taxonomic uh, fine tooth comb issues, uh, but leave those for another day. But it's sure thing, great actually. to be back. It's good to hear your voice, Megan, wide, yeah. and welcome, Jeff. And right. um, I'll leave you to your uh, expedition, and maybe we'll Can hear you. I'll complete? talk. I'll Sorry. chime in, uh, have an opportunity to chime in again later on. Thanks, Chris. Pretty close from Thanks, yeah. Chris. That was awesome. Thank you, I'm not sure okay. that the term uh, Velcro of death is going to get one up on this particular yeah, dive. That was, uh, that was so knowledgeable and, uh, and entertaining. So. Thank you. And, uh, You'll see that Megan is quite adept at exactly turning a phrase, and there are actually people on Twitter who have quoted, who have written down her quotes. It's it's a talent she has, so I expect to be done quite quickly. <laughs> so, so we've got you guys later. You have a fish. Thank you. We've got some really, real excitement going on here in this uh, frame. It looks like uh, some predation going on in the deep sea. Megan, could you care to elaborate, please? Uh, so the fish we're seeing looks like a Uh It's a type of rat tail fish or grenadier. Uh, and it was interacting with that squat lobster that we saw sitting on the bottom. I just think it was checking it out, and uh, the squat lobster just scooted away, 
as they like to do. I think I was telling you about it yesterday, Jeff, where if you did disturb a squat lobster, it would do the squat lobster uh, little bloop, bloop, bloop. This fish seems to have uh, some its damage to up. its eye. Yeah. But, you know, down here in the dark, uh, they don't really need to use their eyes to, to navigate because without us here, uh, this fish probably would have never seen this much light ever in its life. Thank you for that, Megan. One, uh, one follow-up question. So this uh, rat tail checked out the squat lobster, uh, kind of prodded it, the squat lobster retreated. Why didn't the rat tail, or why, why might be a reason the rat tail didn't continue the pursuit? Put the brakes on. Well, that was a pretty big squat lobster, um, and it might not have been a really great prey item for this particular fish. It's going to start to go under us here. Okay, pilot, whenever we're ready to move on, we can get going. Copy that. Okay, video, if you're clear. And then you might see on. this little anemone move in as the fish passes over it. Nope, he's too far off bottom. But that well, is actually, likely let's a stay here. Anemone. If he gives us a good view, we might want to take it. Yeah, you can zoom if you want. So it lives inside yeah, the sediment. You can go ahead and call another move there. And then now. if you disturb it, uh, another long it'll one. pull into its tube. We might just be starting to feel that uh, that other one too. Yep. Uh, we still have quite a bit of distance to travel though before we start yeah. hitting the. So can you tell me a little bit or, or hypothesize about why this rat tail's so eye is distended like yeah. that on its uh, starboard side? Uh, I couldn't tell you. I'm gonna try to get black like background history. for you, uh, Emily. And I, I'm not willing to speculate on what might have happened to this fish. It could be. I don't know. I have no idea. Maybe some fish experts might have oh. a clue. Oh, but there's a fish friend. So now we have two Coraphanoides rat tail fishes. I don't know which one to follow. They're ten they tend to be pretty curious about the ROV. Yeah. Uh, and we'll often notice them falling behind the ROV in the Sirius view. And, I, uh, and during one uh, expedition with a different ROV, uh, we had a few come into our bio box as we were ca collecting samples, just checking out what yes, we had. So. Yeah, that was going to be my next question. Is I know, uh, drawing from my shallow well of biology again, that there are, that scavengers sometimes follow yeah, around thanks. actual predators and kind of try to sneak an easy meal yeah, from something after it's done that eating. Would that yeah. maybe be a similar behavior thanks. to what the rat tail is doing, following what probably looks like an apex predator to do it in a uh, deep discover? So these rat tail fishes are the apex predators. Uh, at these depths. So they're akin to lions on the Sahara. You know, this area is not as densely packed, um, and yeah. they are one of the largest animals down here. Yep. Yeah. You can actually, uh, right underneath you, the heaves are so so big that you're, you're actually causing a yeah, dust storm, too. Yeah, I'm going to come up a little more. Uh, I'm looking at you at 30 degrees, so you're you're pretty yeah, far I'm up there. Yeah, I'm gonna stay here. Watch the pilot. Go ahead, pilot. Hey, we're a little deeper today, so the moves are just taking longer. Um, so appreciate your patience. We're just waiting for the uh, for the vehicles to catch up with the ship, and um, we'll get moving as soon as that happens. Okay, sounds good. Yeah, so just to uh, uh, catch everybody up on some communications with the pilot, we've uh, we've got a little sea state today. Uh, we had a bit of a, a bumpy transit, especially no, towards I mean, when we, we were getting on the we were site. Still getting it was a, a too, marginal so. decision uh, to dive today. I think now that we kind of know how much late our is, you know, incredibly competent maybe jump crew a little quicker, is able but, to get us uh, on bottom down here. There, but I don't the think. extra but motion of the ocean results in us having to be a little more cautious and circumspect circumspect in our movements forward so yeah. bear with us and as I, uh, we're not instead of a uh, line towards instead of focusing on one features. thing and trying to get that shot i, I really should have kind of just like swung uh, around the tether and, the ROV, you know the longer it takes for the motion of the ship to transfer um, but, down uh, our they cable wanted to see that one thing i thought we could get it but, uh, so it's sort of like uh, trying to, to fly a helicopter through a city 
and you're walking your dog on the city street. So you're up here in the helicopter, you have someone in the middle, unless you're serious, and then you have your dog on the street. So to transfer all that motion uh, all the way down the line takes a little bit of time, and it is a delicate dance. That's a great analogy, Megan. So it looks like even though this area, this uh, flat step is uh, more or less majority mantled in pretty fine sediment, and uh, this is what us uh, geology types tend to call hemipelagic sedimentation, Was it hem where hem hemi means half me? in Latin, and then pelagic yeah, is yeah, open yeah, ocean. Yeah, no, so point. this is the yeah, continental margin environment. It's not quite so. full pelagic in terms of full open depth, something like on the order of 3,000 or 4,000 meters deep but it's also not the heavy rain of material that you would get on the continental shelf. So it's halfway between abyssal and coastal, so we call it hemipelagic drape. But as I was uh, going for before I distracted okay. myself with a tangent, uh, we do Sounds see good. a couple uh, sparse evidence of debris on this uh, flat slope here. And that's kind of evidence that um, regardless so really of the mechanism of mechanics that formed these steps, whether it was a turbidity current event or a submarine landslide, it left some evidence of this passage in the form of uh, rubble and talus on the floor of it. Put some more distance on it, maybe? Maybe make it bigger. 30, 40 meters. You can go ahead and kind of measure how far away we are from the first significant contour. Some of these divots in the sediment could be possible whale feeding scars. Um, uh, so I know that the, whales the can one, dive more this closer deep, to the, uh, two so in the that might that also going. be something that we're seeing in this area. Yeah, it's, we have some distance to travel, so I go ahead and toss in probably a yeah, that's 50. Yeah. Sounds good. Sure. I'll bring my head around. Let's we'll come on in here, video. So we got some time here. I just want to look to see what this is. So we're zooming on a, in a little area where there's a demi sponge growing on a slightly more consolidated piece of the sediment here. And around it are uh, perhaps uh, actinarians or anemones, sea anemones now, video. that are growing out of the sediment. Do you so have any more? These demi sponges are likely in the Possilus glarida. Yeah, uh, come um, on a in. type of encrusting Let's try to hold it here. Just get a quick zoom. And it's really uh, distinctive, as yes. you were talking about Keep yesterday, is that well. these encrusting organisms that yeah. seek any opportunity yeah, to I get any sort of elevation good. above the uh, the seabed, it looks like they're taking opportunities for. Um, I can't see our lasers right now, so I can't quite get a sense of scale, but I have to assume this rock okay, is uh, in, quite small. And uh, even that small amount of relief is preferable for these sponges to being on the seabed itself. Hello, Mike Becky Owen here. Hi, Mike. Roger. Hi, I, I think you were asking about the, uh, I just to the gouges in the bottom. To... Yeah. Did you get an answer from anybody well, about that? Some time. I did not. Do you know anything about them? Okay, well, it, adjust the lights on Sirius, yeah, so that was a better. proposal Sounds based on uh, some dives around a, a mud volcano in the Mediterranean that uh, was also the, uh, an area the, where uh, big okay. whales were Come wide video. Uh, were often seen. And uh, It'll, uh, the proposal uh, is that, that the die down as we in the bottom uh, that was, uh, might be made by the, the lower jaw the of the actually. big whale yeah, feeding very close to the bottom. Um, and since then, it's been, uh, video. <laughs> been speculated and over and over again that that's what's going on. It. It's, so far, it's just speculation. We we have no solid evidence other than that the size of the gouges. All right, so three, two, zero. Can we get a zoom on that uh, object over there in the top right-ish? Sure thing, watch lead. Yeah, we're we're, uh, we're headed that way. Um, so basically, that's all I have. A little bit more tether, but it's just that, uh, we'll get one when we're there. Maybe yeah. uh, it's basically just been speculation. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, um, 
That's what that was what I thought too. It's we're speculating that that's what that uh, scar might be from, just because what else could it be? Uh, yeah. I don't think anybody's yeah, actually seen a whale feeding of, uh, while you do a dive. Right. Yeah. But if we did, that would be amazing. Just want to make sure we don't. Um, no, there is evidence it's that super hard sperm whales feed very steps, close to the bottom. So. One of them actually got tangled up in a, uh, a submarine ca cable time and drowned. Um, so it's possible that uh, that they are d diving down very close. And we've seen very large okay, squids on, close video. to the bottom as well, squids that would be prey for and these, these video, whales. I'll let you but, tell uh, about all of that's about consistent the, uh, with, with the fog lights uh, on. interpretation. It's just... Right now, it's speculation, and we don't have any solid evidence yet. Thank you for that, Mike. That's uh, that's really interesting to hear. And I agree, it would be a highlight of the dive to see that. It looks like uh, in screen right uh, yeah. in screen right now, we we've got a nice uh, zoom on uh, what looks like the similar species that we were so uh, seeing before. Uh, Chris or Megan. Survey. Up to the top, yeah, this is likely the stuff. same uh, species yeah, of sea star, the Frayella uh, so elegans that, that Chris Mall was just telling us about, so uh, the type that was named after um, the Greek go goddess. To ROV. And, then if you go down and it's the really bottom, apparent with this uh, great zoom that we're getting from the video from how those uh, seconds, um, little pads coming uh, off the arms that, of the sea star down, would act as so velcro for anything that happens to come across it. Or or yeah, and they can move those little uh, arms, as you see right here, here and articulate them, and that way they can capture things and then sort of bring trying, them down Trying to get rid of that vibration video. My is just I'm having to push down pretty hard. And this little hole that you see on the top of the disc is the exit of the digestive tract. So, in terms of the feeding of this organism, uh, Chris mentioned that, that it's an ambush predator and it'll get fish if it has the chance. Um, does that solely what it subsists on, or does this also we'll filter get, feed uh, when there are lasers larger as things? Soon as video is clear. So, one of the main food items that it captures are hyperid amphipods, and we saw some of those, and we Jay, saw amphipods in five. our samples the Play other day. Down. Roger. And when they're in its feeding posture, all those little sticky Velcro feet okay, will be on the outside. On and that and that's how they'll capture their there prey as it floats by or swims by. And uh, it looks like we just got the lasers on, which is great for scaling. So it looks like ballpark size-wise, these lasers are about 10 centimeters apart, or exactly 10 centimeters apart. So it looks like we've got about a 50 centimeter or half meter or foot and a half wide uh, sea star, which here. is uh, quite a sizable specimen, I think. I don't know the size Please range of the species. Leave the lasers on for now. Kind of large. Also, for your reference, the uh, left toggle button. Yeah, yeah these, I know. I just grabbed uh, the joystick wrong. Sea stars gotcha. do get relatively large. That's about the size that I've seen in other you, locations. You get it in a tough situation. So, Great, thanks. pretty typical. Um, but they can come in all range of sizes. Okay. Looking down Looks at like we're zero. heading on down. Uh, Would you do turn one bank off? Our steep slope area. Of your lights. Uh, I did. Uh, <coughs> Port and starboard outers. Oh, gotcha. And then I left the main zone in the middle. Sounds good. Actually. And well, zone. we've introduced ourselves. Uh, maybe we should introduce our front row. Uh, the front row, and also back here, uh, one of our seats in the back, uh, our our GFOE team from the Global Foundation of Ocean Exploration that run and take video uh, from the Deep, Dis Deep Discover ROV. Uh, can you guys uh, introduce yourselves? Sure. Uh, sitting pilot now, my name is Chris Ritter. Uh, sitting nav station is Chris Wright. As co-pilot, Lars Murphy. In the video chair, I'm Emily Nero. And in the back is is uh, uh, Caitlin Bailey. And we are all w with, with um, uh, GFOE. Thank you guys for the introductions and uh, one other member 
of our team who is not on a headset, but should also be acknowledged as uh, Barry Eakins, our uh, sample data manager for this cruise from uh, NOAA, uh, NOAA's uh, National Center for Earth uh, Environmental Information. Come in here, video. So get this arrow worm. Hold there. And here's a little sneak peek of the water column. We're looking at an arrow worm. They float in this sort of vertical orientation, and then if we were to disturb the water, they'll wiggle away very fast. Bringing it up for you. And so, based on that vertical orientation, do they uh, uh, subsist on uh, marine snow that drifts down from above? Well, I believe they're predators that they'll feed on other plankton. I'm sure we'll learn a lot more when we do our water column uh, dives. We will have three scheduled for this expedition. All right, we can let uh, him go. Sorry, video. Two after the thick portion of the dive, and then one uh, that's a full dive dedicated to exploring the water column. You have some room. You probably have enough. Pilot, I see a out. sea star coming up. Can we take a zoom on that? We can, yeah. Headed that way. On your zoom forward. So... And it does look like in the foreground, yeah, in addition definitely. to a sea uh, star, we see a couple of these other characteristic uh, gouges on the seafloor that we've been discussing. They're, uh, they're debatable origin. Yes. So this looks like some type of slime star in the genus Hymenaster. And uh, Chris Ma has a number of stories about these starfish. So hopefully we'll hear a little bit more about it. Okay, video, come on in. Gonna center up. Okay. Is that you, Chris? Hey, Megan. Hey. It is indeed. Hey, Chris, how's it going? Uh, yeah, the so Slime way. Star. Know, that's, uh, that's quite a uh, distinctive so name. Megan, hello? And, uh, just to be sure Hi. the presentations uh, around the A-frame. Might get clouded yeah, here. So, uh, you are correct. That this is Hymenaster. Um, and uh, this is one of the many if, uh, interesting uh, forms of this species that uh, yeah, I'm still trying to you. narrow, sort of nail down. But I believe this one... I mean, because the Atlantic ones um, have been surveyed closely. This one might be Hymenaster rex, uh, but I have to, I'll have to double check because it has, it has these very distinctive. So this is a slime star, sort of to, to back up or everybody who, who might be seeing one of these for the first time. And um, these are really unusual because <clears throat> all the things that you're seeing right now, this is not actually the surface of the animal, the actual surface of the uh, animal is located below this. Um, everything that you're seeing is what's called the superdorsal membrane. It's like a, it's like a circus tent. And this, this secondary membrane is supported by what's called paxilla, uh, which are uh, sort of narrow... How far are we from uh, that, like 2,500-meter contour? Spines. That, uh, and it keeps the, right uh, the, 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 the yeah, sort of superdorsal down, membrane uh, suspended. Right and, uh, and so basically About what meters, it yeah. does is um, it has this opening good, right in the I center think. of the membrane, and um, uh, and so if you collect one of these, and fortunately I don't think this is a new species, so you know you don't have to be subjected to this. It would produce a copious amount of defense for us, defense yeah. mechanism. Or and in the me. Hawaiian species, Which, I've uh, had um, yeah, looks uh, like we avoided that fun experiences with these the animals get a full frame. and taking them out of the bio box usually leads to, to very dramatic threads of, of slime uh, peeling off of my fingers. Uh, but yeah, um, when you're clear, and we'll these get, get quite a large. This one can be, I think, up to about a foot and a half ahead, across. Them a so um, they're, they're very interesting animals uh, that have a lot of interesting biological features, uh, including really unusual right. um, uh, larval development. And, uh, and phylogenetically, they occur at the base of the asteroid okay, tree. Among other sort of interesting bits. So, Copy. Um, and, uh, you know, in the name, right. of course, Hymenaster. Come on, please. 
probably to the uh, the, the super dorsal membrane and the fact that it's sometimes translucent in some species. All right, I'm going to push almost, ahead uh, here. Did you turn the lasers? Uh, I did, yeah. Okay. It can be almost uh, yeah, uh, uh, see-through in some species. So Probably it's very unusual. Anyway, I'll get back to it. Oh, I have one more question. Great, Chris. thanks. So here comes a shark, I believe. Let's top, come on like, in. What does that do? Oh, oh there. Uh, I'm sorry. I should have mentioned. So nah, um, that's what's called Look like the, one of those dogfish. Um, osculum. Uh, so in the same way that uh, you know, so any opening in a biological structure. Come in a little tighter video. I'm just going to try to follow him. Um, and uh, so in the same way that, that on, on sponges, you know, that top opening is called an osculum. It's, 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 the same kind, it's the same kind of word, you know. But basically, that superdorsal membrane that I uh, spoke of, the opening that is at the top of the animal that opening is where, okay, excuse me. I have to let him go. Uh, the anus and all of the other bits open are, are released into uh, the top of the membrane through Great. that Thanks osculum. And so gas exchange occurs through there. Water comes in through the osculum and, uh, and sort of floods the papula, which are present below the circus tent, if you will. And so, um, and so that's what you're seeing is... Uh, the thing of pulsing, opening and closing, because it's uh, com boat. it's comfortable and water uh, fluctuates, or not fluctuates, but still not sort of sewn around other than me. And out of the um, superdorsal membrane, um, and and you know it's partly the bu the buoyancy of the water is what suspends the animal skeleton, because uh, unless the the superdorsal membrane is and it is it, it can vary from gelatinous to sort of leathery in certain some species, but if it's really soft, it'll collapse. The moment you bring it up on, on the deck of a ship, for example, and so the osculum, you know, is either can, can be fairly well defined or can be poorly uh, supported, right um, but it usually serves to to provide no, um, uh, just... not just water to the animal, but also that's where the mucus comes out. So if you're so is there only a little too, I don't know if it's propelled with any force, just one but like two. in the shallow water species of like the, it's relative, like afters and whatnot. Um, the, the mucus will actually You're be old, ejected from that opening as well as other openings on the surface. So um, one of these days I'm going to have to figure out exactly what these things eat and um, okay. see if, you know, maybe underneath one of yeah, these we'll is a sediment or think of is sponges we'll to, or, or what have you. But, uh, uh, but definitely, um, you yeah, know, they're always real photogenic can, animals and they're a very uh, with the depth in, commonly in encountered um, uh, sort of Megafaunal inhabitant of abyssal oh, depths, right, so and fish. and probably even um, a little shallower, uh, depending get, depending on where you are. So uh, I think you'll from the side uh, here. you'll definitely you know see another one at some point. So anyway, I see that you are looking at fish now. So thanks, Chris. <laughs> I'll talk to you again soon. All right, bye -bye. talk to you later. So we are now looking at a eel fit like fish. Uh, I think it is an eel. Right um, perhaps in the family Synaphobranchidae. Uh, uh, yeah. This is a very strange looking fish to me. I'm not sure if uh, there's something weird with its eye. I don't know. Any very fish experts sediment. on the line? Sorry, watch the lead. He was coming at us pretty pretty quickly, so we just let him go under us, and hopefully we can get an ID from the from a still. Yeah, unfortunately, that uh, fish was uh, a bit spooked by our approach and slipped under the RV, so we couldn't get a uh, locked on it and get a get a tighter close up. But biology doesn't always cooperate. That's true. Um, uh, another thing that I thought was interesting about that flash. fish was how only the very no, end portion one. of the tail was Go moving. ahead, workshop. Um, and normally with the eel-like fishes, more of the body moves. So I'm kind of curious about that. It, it's throwing me off. It kind of originally I thought it was maybe a halosaur. Um, yeah, we do have. Uh, a, a water column expert, Mike Ford, in the chat room, but I think that seemed to be more of an abyssal just the winch, uh, winch check organism, so I'm not yeah. sure if that, uh, that overlaps. Uh, might, maybe uh, on a 
put out like a uh, rough request fish day in like the today, chat maybe. room for anybody to identify if possible. Okay, as we're progressing forward, we see a uh, generally uniform yep. sediment mantle seabed, but also a couple um, sparse um, okay. rubble right. and debris. And just of note is that every single piece of those debris seem to be at least uh, colonized or encrusted in some way by some of those uh, benthic organisms. And just any any way to get higher up into the current flow to Chris, that same expose thing themselves on, uh, to more of the, the nutrient Lars and... Did with the game. Uh, Debris rich water is a uh, blow out some of the environmental adaptation that not is to beneficial. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah, and then if you, it just gives uh, a little bit more you know, contrast in the returns here. There's a Tina four, I think. You want to try to get that video? Oh, these are great. Charismatic little invertebrate to stay low and Even I, as a geologist, know a tinafor when I see one. Uh, I don't know too much about them, other than that they have combs and they're very cool looking. Uh, care to educate okay, me a little bit, uh, Megan, or anybody else? We get a few seconds of it. Well, to be honest, I don't know that much about tinafors either. Uh, but those little cilia that are beating, that's what makes that really beautiful rainbow color. I'll just let you work the zoom, Emily. And that's how they swim through the water column. And they're pretty, uh, you know, ubiquitous animals throughout the water column. And just to confirm um, that the lights that we're seeing, the light show on those Tina fours, that isn't bioluminescence. That's a reflection of our lights off of the comb, correct? That's right, yeah. So it's not producing its own light, but the way how thin each of those little cilia are are reflecting our light back as a rainbow. So would it be correct to call it nature's disco ball? <laughs> you can call it that for sure, Jeff. Yeah, I'm good with that. And if my biological oceanography uh, memory yeah. serves me correctly, those cilia uh, yeah, bring I, I uh, tilt, kind of suspended blue, uh, particulate matter, which is pretty clearly yeah, in the shot as well, uh, to the feeding yeah, orifice, and that's kind of how they subsist. And obviously it has to be a pretty successful survival strategy because uh, they, are, they are ubiquitous. I believe uh, the term uh, that biologists use is here. cosmopolitan for something that has a really wide geographical distribution. So as we uh, progress onward towards uh, the, the wall of the, the next step of so Feral Steps uh, Canyon, the which was the goal of our yeah. dive, um, we'll, we'll be making progress. Uh, it's a little little slower going than it would be if we were in shallower yeah. water or if we were in a slightly calmer sea state. Uh, you so want to try to get us out of this video? Okay, let's do it. Go ahead, in. I'll just try to hold center. You can work the zoom. So uh, right now we are zooming in on another fish. This is a fish in the family Moridae, likely Antimora. Um, I'm not remembering what the it's common right name for these us. fish are, but I like that little face. There's also a coral behind this fish. <laughs> It really wanted to check us out, for sure. They said, tend to be pretty curious. And it's probably yeah. not hyperbole to say that uh, seeing Deep Discover is a once-in-a-lifetime uh, event for a fish like this. I figured he would go one way or the other. But I would say you're right. Kind of just caught our bluff. What's that out there? Maybe. 
got some room if you want to go check it out. So it looks like a couple objects are uh, coming into our view. One at the center and one towards the right. Um, Come on in here, video. Just want to see what it is. Start. It's a balloon. Oh, sad. That's not an animal. That looks like a balloon. Yeah, we can come on. We were lucky enough to get no evidence of human habitation on our dive yesterday, but I think our luck has already ran out today. Uh, plastic is a, uh, and rubber is a very tenacious and persistent uh, object in the oceans. So these balloons that people release in the air, this is where this their final resting place usually ends up being. So we don't, we need to keep track of our, our plastics and rubbers so they don't end up in our oceans. Okay, let's come on in here. But now we have a beautiful sea urchin. And I'm going to shakily test my biological oceanography knowledge by saying this is uh, an echinoderm, is that correct? Yes, it's an echinoderm. All right. <laughs> uh, it's a type of echinoid, which it means sea urchin. And as an echinoderm, that's also relatively closely related to the uh, sea star and the uh, basket stars that we were looking at a couple of minutes ago, correct? Yes. So... Those are all echinoderms. Okay. Yeah, so this be. one is likely in the in the family Echinotheridae, and what I really like about these urchins is they have these little hooks on some of their spines. It looks like they're galloping across the sea floor. So possibly a uh, tromycosoma. Hello. So now hey, if, we, <laughs> if we keep up point two, um, pretty consistent. I was going to say, I think you're about long, long uh, on the track there. Point. I would venture the same uh, genus or something uh, similar to it. Actually, um, the other is I definitely can tell you that it's any kind of thurid because if you uh, pan down to the spines right around the edge of the uh, lower surface, you'll notice Sorry, that a bunch of them have these little white kind of hooves on them. And... Oh, sure, um, yeah. They use those to sort of assist uh -huh. them in walking along the, the sedimented side? bottom. And uh, this is a, a, a feature of everything in the kind of third day proper. Um, some of them, I think, are a little bit better developed. But, um, uh, yeah, you can sort of see these little, they almost look like, yeah, that's all like I said, like have. hooves. And um, and they, as far as I can tell, they, they use you these the to just gallop along the bottom. Warm. They can be quite agile as yeah. far as urchins go. These also go by the name pancake urchins because uh, water pressure is essentially all that holds all right. their test up. And so if these were to be brought up on the deck of the ship, their uh, bodies would collapse. The skeletons would collapse. And hence, and when they were originally collected with trawls, their bodies would just uh, would literally just fall into sort of flat circles. And hence the, the name pancake urchin became sort of a, a, a common term for people who studied them, uh, you know, sort of after the fact. Yep. Uh, this was years before people actually began uh, yeah. um, seeing them in situ uh, with video. No, um, so the other thing that you might want to keep an eye open for, because in all likelihood we will see more of these, but on top of the animal, there, uh, there's a little I'm sort of complex, an apical complex, and that's where the anus is located. And um, I'll bet you at some point in the next two weeks we're going to see one of these and we're going to catch it pooping. So, um, And I, for, for whatever reason, I think that's really fascinating. So, yeah, I see that dark purple area um, right in the center there. That's where the, that's where the poop comes yeah, out. That's, that's where the anus is located. To to the and, um, and some of... And sometimes, I mean, then when they poop, they have these little, they perfectly the round, wall, sort of sedimented and, balls. And, and, um, and uh, you know, when they do problem, this, but, uh, they come out in a little parade. And so, point. you know, when you, hopefully you'll get to catch that at some point um, right, video, if you're about done, uh, while you're, on this. you're roaming around on the, the sedimented bottom here. Um, right. I've never asked anybody to collect yeah. these because rumor has it that 
if you this isn't published necessarily but these yeah. are descended or related to i should say the fire urchins in the tropical pacific okay, and um uh, and uh, uh, these can actually give you a painful sting so the right. spines can can actually give you a a bit of a, a painful uh, reminder that you were touching one so um if uh we end up collecting something that looks like one of these uh, <laughs> weird sick gloves at the release. So. Well, that's good to know. Uh, didn't realize that it would be a painful organism to collect. But maybe we will see <laughs> well, uh, some uh, interesting urchin events as we go through. I have seen one of those urchins move really fast, and I have to keep telling people of the video, like, I didn't speed it up. That's how fast it's going. Because it's unbelievable. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, again, you know, I mean, when I when I never – using the word gallop with a sea urchin doesn't seem to come naturally, but it is very true with these animals. They just use those little hooves, and they get around surprisingly uh, quickly. So um, I don't know if you guys could stop, but I thought I saw a small red stock crinoid or something just just that, just then. Yeah, I saw it too, um, but I have seen them around, so maybe we'll stop at the next one. Yeah, of course. I understand you have to meet the waypoint and touch. Yep. Okay, uh, I'll let you get back to it, and um, uh, always a pleasure. I'll talk to you guys all in a little while. Thanks, Ma. See you later. Bye-bye. Yeah, sorry, Megan. If you guys see another one... Um, that it doesn't look like we get eyes on just uh just yell out and we'll we'll go take a look we we kind of had to get moving on that one understood yeah In the absence Good. of the forest of bamboo okay, coral yeah. that we were seeing yeah, yesterday, really this like. solitary stalk uh, is quite distinctive. What are we looking at here? We're gonna get we're gonna get the next crinoid. Let's get this for now. Think of, if you slam on your brakes and this, it's just so it's unbranched. Sort of, yeah. We know that. Sorry, Emily. Uh, we'll get the next like one. It looks like it's anchoring in the sediment, but there could be some right. hard substrate underneath the sediment layer. Okay, let's come on in. So that leads to a lot of different conclusions. As we zoom into the polyps, the structure of the polyp will tell us more about what this coral is. So it could be a bamboo coral. So we have to look for those nodes and internodes. And then also the bamboo Tilt corals little. have little um, sclerites or spines on their polyps. And I'm seeing those between the tentacles. We call those intertentacular yeah, I thought spines. I could get a dark background, so I do believe I this think is it's a tall bamboo enough. coral. That was really interesting to be walked through the, uh, the stages of the diagnosis for how to identify a species. Yeah, it's really important to know the different characters to look for for each type of coral. Uh, so you can start wheedling down what it may be. There are so many options, especially when you see things from far away. And when you're trying to identify animals from video, these zooms are really important for helping us characterize what's in the area. And then if we see something like this again, even though we might not be able to get a zoom, we can use this information to help us identify other animals. Yeah, let's see in there. And it's really fascinating, again, to, to look at this and walk through this process. And uh, as Chris just reminded us a minute ago, previously all researchers had about, you know, maybe 30 years ago was uh, trawls, which was destructively yeah. sampling the seafloor and bringing up whatever they could get through yeah. thousands of Thanks. meters of water and the pressure Thanks. change that comes along with them. So yeah. fine-scale structures it, like really these, uh, like, I can imagine, yeah, really would not be preserved at so all uh, in a trawl sampling down. as opposed to this kind of coming bad. down to their playground and meeting them on their terms. It just provides so much more information and context. 
Yeah, and that coral would generally yeah, grow on a every, hard substrate, so there's likely like, there's um, slight pool hard substrate there. right underneath here. What's up in the water column there? Is that just another? Now we're seeing uh, yeah. a fish in the water column. This looks like a halosaur to me. They always, they seem to always have this I'll sort of posture center. with their uh, fins sort of back behind will. them, tail up in the air, well, up in the water. Great, thanks. Yeah, that, thanks uh, and they have sort good. of a flat duck bill type no nose. Pretty far away. And yeah, fine with a me. good way to tell between yeah. the different genera is to look at the top of the nose and see if it has scales or it doesn't have scales. So this is a fish called a halosaur in the family Halosauridae. And it's really apparent to me compared to the one that we saw a few minutes ago, uh, as you were saying, how much more of this creature's body the is the functional fin that propels it forward as opposed to the other one, which the head is or the maybe whole specimen one eighth of its body length actually had fins okay. and was being used for propulsion. Ah, copy. Yeah, so this looks a little, a lot different than that fish that I, we were looking at before that was sort of in between an, an eel and this type of fish. going to try to follow them. And we call this fish like an eel-like fish because it has I'll that eel-like body form and swims by undulating its back body. And that's a very efficient swimming method. So as it's turning in the water column, maybe we'll get a nice view of its nose. Of course. Maybe not. It's not being very cooperative. No, I think it uh, just did just about the opposite of what you requested. <laughs> I think uh, I think some work on training your uh, your fishes in the future, Megan. You gotta train your your tiny sea dragons. <laughs> the the fins sort of look like little wings. I'm definitely getting the dragon vibe. That's for sure, and. I'm uh, just to confirm uh, something you said. So this is an eel-like fish. The reason that it is not an eel proper is that because it has scales, or is there something else that separates eels from fishes? This is probably a We're gonna very basic biology attempt. question, but at the head here, looking down five zero, plenty of time. Sounds good. I wish we had a, a fish person on the line because I don't know if I can do that question proper justice. But yeah. uh, this isn't a group of bony around. fishes, and the eels um, are also uh, fishes in themselves, but they're genetically different. Did we get another move in? Is that right? Yes. Okay, great. Oh, what have we here? That's a really strange looking rock like thing. Great, thanks. Seems a little random. I hope it's not more trash. It, it could be. Looks like a bag. Yeah. yeah. It kind of does look like, you know, non-natural substrate. It could actually be a rock. No, it's no. not. It's definitely not. There's something on it, though. Do you want to take a closer look? Yeah, let's look at Kay. what's on this thing. Sorry, now I repeat your last. Okay, great. Do you want me to swim my head over? It kind of looks video? like a fake rock. Nah, keep it there for now. Come on in, video. Does look like a fake rock. Huh. Maybe it's metal. Yeah. Tart. Yeah. Too too smooth to be an actual rock, but regardless yeah. of whether it's a real or a fake rock, it's certainly being encrusted like one. Well, this shiny portion right here leads me to think it's crushed metal. Yeah, I'm going to so go with that hypothesis. Either? And, uh... Yeah, why don't you come over and yeah, look at me? Yeah, it could be a bag. Come over. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, see the rips in it? Yep. Yeah, it's yeah. a plastic bag. And just to, to orient everybody, we're in a fairly remote location uh fairly far offshore I don't and know what uh that is, 
this is yeah, this yeah. trash makes its way out here um, but, uh, either from like, land or directly dumped overboard uh, and uh, so while organisms can make a home on it it's okay. it's not Let's ideal it's enough trash that big bag did have a sea